All right, welcome back to Iron Anchor Cycles and part seven of our Lowrider S build series. In this video, we're gonna talk about a piece that I think a lot of folks have been waiting for, and that is the final installation of our hard bags and fairing. So this bike has gone through a lot of phases. Obviously, we're up to part eight now. We did a lot of work in some small areas, some bigger areas. Uh, we did suspension, we did a pipe, we did a whole bunch of little pieces. Uh, but I think where everybody saw this going, uh, and if you follow us on Instagram, uh, you saw the final product already, uh, you knew that what we were doing was building uh, the Sport Touring Lowrider S here. So this video, we're gonna walk through exactly what we did and show you some of the details. Uh, I will say now, uh, in an effort not to drag you too far into this video, if you're looking for something different, uh, we're not gonna show you how to do the fairing. Uh, there are some videos out there, there's not a lot of great content on it, uh, and I can actually personally understand why that is. Uh, when attempting to shoot some video of doing this fairing, it really, really was difficult. Uh, there's a lot of little uh, fitments and on and off and, you know, cutting and measuring and, and, and just moving things around. And there's video footage, we have it, and I'll tell you from having to watch it, it's really, really boring. Um, there's just, it takes a ton of time to get this fairing on perfectly. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is uh, a little bit later in the video. Uh, I've got some feedback on that, but I just wanna make that call out right now, nice and early that this is not gonna be an install or a how-to video. This is really just gonna be a video about showing you what the final product can look like and some of the options that there are and some of the choices that we made. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into it and talk about what we did. So. The first piece I'm gonna talk about because we're standing close to them and the camera's already pointed in this direction is the hard bags. So these should hopefully look familiar to you. Uh, these are Harley OE uh, Sport Glide uh, hard bags. Now, there's a lot of uh, you know discussion about how to get these, where to get these, whatever else. Um, the used market for them is pretty on fire at the moment uh, and the prices are just sort of skyrocketing. I've seen them most recently listed for upwards of 2,500 bucks for the set of them, uh, which in my personal opinion, they are not worth, but uh, it's a supply and demand thing, I suppose. Um, these bags can be got directly from Harley. The reason though that they get so expensive is that Harley doesn't have one part number for the entire assembly. What you wind up having to do is buy a whole bunch of different individual pieces, the outer, the inner, the brackets, and you know all the other stuff that goes along with it and when you add that all up it gets really really expensive to do it and you still if you want to uh, have to get it painted because it's just going to come in either the sort of satin color it starts off with or i do think they sell a vivid black version of it as well so we bought a used set off of somebody who had a sport glide and decided that he didn't want the bags anymore uh, we got a pretty good deal on them so i'm pretty happy about that and we took them apart and then sent them out to get painted. And we obviously matched the color on our Midnight Crimson Lowrider S. So when we went to the painter, obviously uh, we had a couple of pieces. We had a, a right side and a left side bag. We also did the side covers. Uh, it was just sort of an easy throw in, uh, you know, to get painted while we were doing everything else. And then obviously uh, the fairing was the final piece for paint. So these bags work out great. Um, we'll look at a couple of details. Um, some good things, some bad things. The good things, uh, right off the bat, they match the bike really well in terms of the lines. They fit now properly with our two into one exhaust and the bracket that we showed in either the last video or the video before that uh, to hold the support bracket here. And the on and off is super simple. Um, you just open it up, you turn this knob to unlock and the bag just slides off and that's, it's that easy. And what it leaves behind is a super clean uh, fender that doesn't have a whole bunch of you know, crap hanging off of it that you're like, oh yeah, the bags got taken off. Uh, you could certainly run the bike without the bags on it and it looks great. Um, and then to put it back on, it's just the opposite. This is a little easier to do on the ground uh, so you can see these and get it lined up better, but I'm gonna do it from here. Okay, that's in, lock and it's on. So that's the pro. The con of this setup is they're a little loose. Um, you know, I don't think they're gonna fall off necessarily, but I don't love uh, the tolerance of this and how much play there is in it. And the other side is the same. Um, 
I'm used to uh, Leather Pros bags, like we run them on, uh, uh, I run them on my uh, Dyna. I have it on two different bikes, I can swap them back and forth. They fit much, much more securely and they feel a lot more substantial. Um, but I think, as I've said before, that's the difference between uh, boutique bespoke manufacturing and Harley Davidson. Um, and that's just a topic for another conversation. But, so that's the bags. Um, Obviously, we did the side covers I mentioned. Uh, we just had our logo put on here, because why not? Um, we'll move the camera around, we'll take a look at the other side, and then we'll dig into the meat of this, uh, which is, I'm sure, most interesting to most of you. Uh, we'll take a look at the fairing and see what we did there. Okay, so taking a look at the, the bike from the back, uh, we get a look at both bags. Uh, I think it's got a really mean look from the back of the bike. I really love... Uh, how everything goes together and the the painted colors and the black work well. Uh, it was asked, uh, my painter asked me why uh, we didn't want to paint the insides of the bags. And I said, really the first piece was because uh, they're not smooth. They've got texture to them. And I just decided painting them was going to not come out the way we wanted it to. But actually looking at the aesthetic of the bike, kind of right down the middle, these, uh, kind of, we'll call them, uh, I'm blanking on, on the, the term for it, but uh, the finish of this, the wrinkle black, there we go, wrinkle black, you have here, it matches what's going on on the center console. Uh, and to some extent, this seat as well. So what you get is this sort of strip that comes down the middle, uh, you know, this way of the wrinkle black that ties really nicely into the dash console. So I really dig that. Uh, one thing that's a little weird back here, um, may have noticed it on some other bikes or may not have, is uh, the bags are not the same size. They're different. Uh, and that's obviously the right bag is shorter, and that's to accommodate the exhaust. Uh, so if you're thinking about packing these or using these or whatever, obviously the left side bag is going to hold more than the right side bag. So it looks a little funny from the back side, but that's just what you got to do if you want to use these bags. So. That is a pretty good view from here. Let's keep moving and we'll see some more. All right, so here's our fairing from the front view. Obviously, uh, it's a pretty dramatic change to the bike. These fairings really, really change the look and feel of the bike and they have a tremendous amount of great functionality, which is really the reason uh, they've gotten so popular uh, in addition to uh, the aesthetics, obviously. So looking at it from this angle, let's talk about a couple of things. Uh, First of all, uh, this fairing is from RWD, and it comes in, I don't want to say a raw fiberglass, it is primed on the outside, but still requires uh, body work to get it smooth. It's not totally perfect and ready for paint. Uh, and that's a good thing because it does require some modifications. Um, what this comes with is not entirely what you're looking at here. We did make some changes. so. Um, Number one, I think is most obvious, is the windshield is from Clockworks. So this is an FXRP windshield from Clockworks, and it bolts right up to uh, the RWD FXR fairing. So they call this, you know, on their website, RWD, an FXR fairing. They don't call it an FXRT fairing, and the reality is it's not really an FXRT fairing. It's actually more like an FXRP fairing. And that distinction can be better seen when we look at it from the back side. Uh, and we'll go there next. But suffice it to say, this windshield, uh, the spec for it from Clockworks is an FXRP windshield and it fits perfectly on here. So there are some height options and tin options from Clockworks like there are with the rest of their windshields. So if you're looking for something like that, check it out. I personally think it makes a huge difference over uh, the windshield that comes with it from RWD, which is less a windshield and more just a flat piece of, I don't know, Lexan or plexiglass or whatever it is, but it's just a, a, a cut out sort of trapezoid with holes cut in the bottom. And then you have to sort of pl pry it into place and screw it down. Um, and it just, it doesn't really look super great. And it, it it's obviously not shaped. So it's, it's forced and tweaked and, and torqued. And this is a nice upgrade. Uh, so that's number one. Um, the next thing is the headlight. Obviously the kit does not come with a headlight. I don't think that should be come as a surprise to anybody. So this particular headlight is from Custom Dynamics and it's their seven inch adaptive headlight. Uh, and what that means is that you're gonna have light uh, constantly in the center for high and low beam. And then you have these lights that are fillers around the sides that will be 
activated with the bank angle of the bike to fill in as you're making turns. It's really cool and it is super, super bright. Uh, the first day we rode this bike after we finished the work, uh, we went, I don't know, about 30 miles down the highway, hung out for a while. It was daytime, came back at night and this light, this headlight with just the low beam, I was able to ride with my uh, tinted helmet shield down the whole time uh, and still be able to see uh, with the light that came from this. So um, we've used some other headlights on other bikes in the past. Um, the Custom Dynamics lights with or without the adaptive are still pretty expensive. Um, and we sort of shied away from that in certain cases in favor of some of the less expensive alternatives that I thought at the time were fine, but after experiencing this, there's really no comparison. So I think we'll probably go back and upgrade some other headlights that we've done before uh, now that we see how, how good this one from Custom Dynamics is. So uh, why I mentioned the headlight here though is there is a bracket in here. So there's this ring that holds the headlight onto the bracket and then the bracket itself that has your adjusters for left, right, up and down uh, that screws into the fairing and screws through into the uh, bracket behind it. That piece, there is one that comes with a kit from RWD. The problem is it's not black, it's raw metal. Uh, so it's silver in color and it really, really stands out in here. And in my opinion, just looks horrible. Um, that is that setup in that color exists on a lot of the like Batwing bikes. Uh, it's a very similar setup, but the difference is, and I'm gonna move over here, on the Batwing bikes, you would have a trim ring that would clip in around this with a little screw at the bottom. Actually, I'll grab it and show it to you. Okay, so that's this. And this should look familiar if you've had like a, an FL uh, Batwing bike. So it's got three little cutouts for the adjuster screws, and then it's got a screw at the bottom, and there's supposed to be a spring clip up in here at the top. And this would go something like that. And it covers up all that shit that's back there. Uh, so we bought one of these first going, hey, we'll just cover all that up. We'll put this on and it'll look super clean. Well, this doesn't fit. So because the space in here is so tight, this piece won't sit in there correctly. So tried that, hoping it would work. It doesn't, um, you could probably modify this, um, but we just decided it was easier to just buy another bracket that's black. I suppose you could paint the one they gave you, but there's a whole lot of moving parts and I just wouldn't get into it. The brackets are super cheap. I think it was 20 bucks to get a, a replacement bracket. So we did that and I think it really looks great now. I think all that stuff kind of blends into the background and you don't really see it. Um, one thing that's missing from here is there is supposed to be a uh, cover, uh, similar material to the windshield that screws into these four uh, captive nuts uh, that are stuck in here. So the kit comes with one that's clear, which I did not like the way it looked. So we decided we wanted to opt for one that was tinted more to match the windshield. So uh, those can be had and they can be bought. Clearview Shield sells them. They're not inexpensive for what they are. I wanna say like with shipping and all in, it's gonna cost you close to a hundred bucks for a piece of plastic. Um, so we said, hey, let's try something and let's put some paint. The Got it at AutoZone. It's like the like taillight uh, turn signal tint spray. Uh, I think VHT makes it. So he said, let's just try painting this. What's the worst that, that happens? It either looks like shit and we throw it away or uh, we just you know, have to buy a new one anyway. So we tried it and it looks all right. The problem is it blocks all the light coming out of the headlights. So it's really not uh, something I would recommend. And so now we're just waiting for Clearview to send us uh, a lighter tinted uh, cover for this. So in the meantime, I would have just run the clear one, but now that it's painted, we can't use it because it's ruined. So um, it's just gonna stay like this for the time being. So it's all right, not obviously final. Um, the headlight doesn't really need the protection. So uh, no big deal. So that is what we've got going on up here. Uh, you'll notice you have the vent holes here um, on the RWD fairing. RWD does sell uh, some screens that will go in there that I think are a nice detailed touch. Um, we did buy them and I tried putting them on and tried playing with them a little bit and I just really wasn't happy with the way they fit and the way they looked. So um, I really didn't like how this looked before the fairing was painted. It was these, these giant holes that were just sort of staring back at you and looking unfinished. But now that it's painted, 
that really blends away. And because all the stuff from the bike, the fork and the frame and everything you see back there is black, it really just blends in and the holes don't bother me so much anymore. So we're happy to leave it this way. And I think that's how it's gonna stay unless we come up with something else to do in these holes. So uh, that is the front side. And I think that's all to say about that. I wanna look at the other side and then we'll talk a little bit about the install, how that goes, and what maybe what to kind of expect or plan out if you're planning on doing this yourself. All right, so here's a view of the fairing from the rider's perspective. Uh, sorry about the camera angle here. It's just a little harder to get a good shot at this side. I will change the camera position and get in a little closer, kind of looking down so you can see some more details. But for right now, we can kind of just take a look at this from the macro perspective. Um, obviously, this is a super, super clean, uh, really nice looking setup uh, when you're riding the bike. It also functions really well too. It does a very good job of taking the wind off your body and making the, the, the ride much more manageable, particularly at, you know, we'll call it uh, excessive uh, speeds. <laughs> um, you've got, uh, in our case, we added a stereo to it. Um, this is not something, this is for my, me personally, and again, this is, I mean, a shop bike, not spec for a customer, but just sort of building this out. Um, I don't personally think that the stereo is a super important detail. Um, uh, again, for me, um, you know, I use my phone Bluetooth to the Lexan in my helmet and that's where I get music from if I want it. Um, the stereo obviously works well when the bike is quiet, uh, either parked or at low speed. But if you're wearing a full face helmet and you're on the highway, you're not gonna hear this. Uh, you're gonna hear what's going on in your helmet way better. So. Really, this was a little bit more about just one, filling the space, because obviously there's just a lot of blank panels on this fairing that we wanted to use for something. Um, but also really just, again, for all of you to kind of show you what the possibilities are. And we want to go on everything we're doing on this bike. We want to go all the way rather than halfway and leave you going, well, I was going to do this other thing. And, you know, you didn't show it to me. So uh, we, we go the full distance. Um, so what we've got is a set of Rockford Fosgate speakers. Um, these are, I'm gonna get the size wrong. They're one size down from the six and a halfs. I believe it's five and three quarters is the standard size. Uh, you're gonna wanna be very careful if you're doing this. Number one, every five and three quarter inch speaker is not the same size. Um, sort of like a two by four from Home Depot. You're gonna have to really check and see the nominal size might be five and three quarter, but the actual size for both the cutout and also the, the grill is gonna be, a, it's gonna be different. So obviously looking at this, these speakers come right to the very edge. Um, and I was not comfortable going any bigger than this. And in fact, I almost swapped these for something slightly smaller once we saw it, but we decided that it looked okay and it all, it all blended well. Um, and obviously the smaller you go, the worse the sound quality is gonna be, or let me strike that. On a, on a comparable speaker, you'll get more out of a bigger one than out of a smaller one. You'll have to drive more to it to get it to do uh, the same amount on a smaller speaker, so it won't sound as good. So um, these, are, these are good speakers. They're from Rockford. Like I said, we're a Rockford Fosky dealer, which is why I opted for their speakers. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that that's what you should use. There are certainly other options out there that are marine grade speakers that work really well, that may even put out more power than this. We just really like the Rockford products here, uh, particularly like what we do on the baggers. So we just decided to use as much of their stuff as possible. So uh, we've got their speakers and we've got their head unit. And this head unit is kind of cool and also leaves a little something to be desired. So. Um, Let's, let's zoom in a little on that. Let's talk about this and we'll talk about some other pieces. Okay, uh, this is the best I can do for a camera angle. I'm really sorry about that. Um, this is just not an easy thing to get the camera in front of. Um, maybe we'll try again with the bike on the ground and see if we can get at it better. But uh, I think what I wanna show you is gonna be visible here. So this is the head unit, uh, if you can kind of call it that from uh, Rockford Fosgate. Uh, I was really psyched about a couple of things about it. One was its size. It's really small and it fits in this panel here uh, that we, we had for the, the radio. Um, what I don't like about it is how uh, tall it is or thick it is in this direction. Um, there's a lot of meat here that obviously they got electronics and stuff in there and you know, I don't know how to design a head unit so maybe that's as small as it can be. But it would be nice if 
more of this was behind the panel and it didn't stick out so far. So that is a small complaint um, and not a super big deal. Um, what I do like about it is it's super easy to set up and it's very high quality. It's a marine unit. Um, hopefully you'll be able to hear what I do. The positive click on the buttons and on the volume knob. Uh, it's got a really nice feel to it. It feels premium. It feels watertight. Uh, I dig it. Um, one thing I don't like about it is there's a whole lot of buttons here. I mean, well, there's not compared to a head unit, but compared to what this does, there's a whole lot of buttons here. Um, this unit does nothing but Bluetooth. And when I say nothing but Bluetooth, I literally mean that. Uh, the, the unit has a USB input on it. And so you say, oh, okay, cool. I can plug my phone in and they sell an auxiliary USB plug, which you probably can't see in the camera angle, but it's down here at the bottom uh, of the inside of the fairing, so we can plug a phone in to charge it. So in the footnotes of the product description, that USB input is for charging only. It doesn't work as an audio source. So, all right, it's there and you can charge your phone and that's cool, but it would be nice to be able to eliminate the Bluetooth function and also uh, be able to charge the phone at the same time. So. Got to do what you got to do. It is what it is, um, and it works fine. So those are all of the details, except for one which I've left off, which is the most annoying feature of this thing, and I haven't been able to figure out how to get rid of it. Um, this is set up, uh, the way we wired it is, it's got a constant power along with the amp, and then it's got a trigger turn on. Uh, the, the head unit has a, a trigger turn on that comes from uh, an ignition source, ignition relay on the bike, and then uh, it's, it itself triggers the amp to turn on. So when we turn on the bike, uh, so I just flip, flipped the ignition switch, the radio is not gonna come on and that's because I have it turned off. And the reason I have it turned off is because when it turns on, it does this. Bluetooth mode. That is super annoying. And it's probably gonna say something else again when it connects to my phone. Um, it's, you know, every time you turn your bike on, there's this booming loud voice that's matched at the volume of wherever you left the, uh, the stereo when you shut it off of this lady telling you the Bluetooth mode is on. I personally find that incredibly annoying. So the way to avoid having to have, it's never gonna stop doing it, at least as far as I can tell, but the way to avoid having it happen every time you turn the bike on. Bluetooth connected. Like I said, there she is again. Um, the only way to have that not happen is if you shut the radio off before you shut the bike off, it won't automatically turn back on. So when you turn the ignition switch for the bike on, like I did before, it's not going to do anything. And then when, you know, once the bike is started and you're sort of riding, you can just hit the button and turn it on and do your thing. Um, I find that really dumb. Um, I, I don't know what they were thinking with that. It's so annoying and so obtrusive. Um, it really honestly makes me hate the whole thing, but, um, that's that. Uh, one other component I mentioned for the stereo was the amp, and I'm sure, hopefully in this shot, you can see the four bolts, uh, bolt heads that are sticking out here. The amp is mounted on the inside of the fairing um, and then just through bolted to hold it in place. Um, it works really well. You know, wiring it's super easy. You obviously run your feed up the neck of the bike, uh, power feed, I should say. Um, it comes in here. Everything, all the wiring is self-contained back here going between the head unit and the amp. And then you just have a, a speaker wire running to each speaker. Super easy, super clean. Um, so that's the stereo and that works pretty well. Uh, let's, let's move and get another angle and uh, we'll talk about some more details. Okay, so with the bike on the ground, you can see what I was just talking about a little bit better. Um, here is the uh, USB plug I mentioned and you can see the screws for the amp here um, and the space that we were working with. So another thing I wanted to point out here was uh, just to show you kind of what this looks like, um, you know, in terms of w what would be involved in, in mounting it. I'm gonna try and zoom in here a little. Um, there we go. So what you've got is this bracket here, um, here that mounts around the, uh, neck of the bike and kind of under where the gas tank mounts and it sticks out, you know, however far that is. And then there's a square plate welded to the front of it with four holes in it. 
and that is what the fairing mounts to. It's very similar to how our road glide fairing mounts. Um, and so that bracket has to be put on, that bracket has to be straight, and then the fairing has to go on and the fairing has to be put on straight. And we're gonna come back to that conversation uh, in a little bit. Uh, but I did wanna show you here, so you've got a hole in the side of this bracket, which is where your headlight wire comes through, and then this harness um, inside this wire loom is the harness that we made for uh, the stereo, for the power and ground wires to, to run uh, down to the battery. So that's kind of what this looks like. Um, let me back up a little bit and just uh, try and give you a little more perspective on sort of how this moves. And we'll talk a little bit about fitment. Um, let's go right there. So if I get on the bike here, um, obviously you can see, just make sure we're fully in the shot. You can get full lock from one side to the other on the fairing. Works really well. Uh, that is a place, and RWD does mention it, that depending on your model, you may have to trim the inside on the bottom of the fairing so that the fork will clear from full lock to full lock. And we did have to do that on this bike. Um, that's totally understandable, right? Because if the fairing is originally designed for like a 39 millimeter application, a 49 millimeter or an inverted fork is gonna be much bigger, um, and so you're gonna need to make room for it. So that's totally cool. Um, and it makes total sense and it's really easy to do. Um, and obviously the final product is, it's awesome. I really have no, uh, nothing negative to say about what the, the function of this is and the value of doing it once it's complete. From the perspective of a rider or just somebody seeing it, you're like, yeah, that's rad. Um, it's from the guy doing it who's got some issues and some little details that, that bother me even once it's done um, that just make it a little bit frustrating, but um, not, not a deal breaker though. So let's talk a little bit about this kit um, and kind of what some of the, the challenges were with it. Okay, so uh, getting to wrap up here and talk a little bit about sort of the overall feelings on all of this. Um, if we start with the saddlebag portion of this, um, there's not a lot of feedback to give. It's a very easy thing to do. You just put the mounting hardware on and put the bags on, get them painted if you want. Um, they function really well, they look great. They're made by Harley, so take that for what it's worth in terms of how well they, they fit and function on the bike. Um, they, they're expensive now, uh, just because of the way the market is, but just like everything else, I think it will be cyclical, and I think the prices of those bags will come back down to earth at some point. Um, let's talk about the fairing, though. Um, I think, you know, there's always a lot of conversations about fairings, about what fairing people have, and what mounting kit they use, and all this other stuff, and I'm gonna give you my opinion just sort of straight up on this one, and I, and I don't say this lightly because I'm not in the habit of uh, criticizing the quality of the products of manufacturers for whom we are a dealer. And we are an RWD dealer and we work with them on a lot of stuff. Um, I really, really don't think they did a good job with this fairing. And I'm sorry if that's, you know, not a, not a fair assessment. Um, and maybe my complaints are a little bit too nitpicky, but the amount of work it takes to get this fairing to fit this bike and have it be straight is kind of crazy for something that's supposed to be a product designed to fit a certain bike. Uh, if you're fabricating something, it's going to take a long time. If you're modifying something that, let's say you bought an FXR, a real FXR P fairing or T fairing and put it on a lowrider S, yeah, there's going to be a lot of work to get that to go on right. But something that's being sold with a mounting bracket and a kit should fit better than this does. Um, and the reason I, I say that is because it's expensive. Um, you know, a raw unpainted fiberglass fairing with the mounting kit and all that. I don't remember what the, what the retail price is on it, but, um, it's not less than 1500 bucks. I don't think, um, maybe I'll, I'll look at the, uh, when I go to edit this, I'll put the real price on the screen here just to, to be accurate. But, um, if you're sitting at home wondering, you know, do I spend the extra money on the RWD fairing? Uh, or do I just go to the eBay, Amazon knockoff and just buy one of those for half the price? I got to tell you, if I was doing this again, that is exactly what I would do. I don't expect those fairings to be any better. I don't expect them to fit any better, but 
if they're half the price, well, then you know you get what you pay for and you're gonna have to do the work to make it work. This, I really don't think should require this much. So um, what, what are my complaints and how, and what were the issues? Um, so to start off with the bracket that mounts the fairing to the bike. It's a big steel bracket and you put it on and it has the ability to be sort of adjusted up and down, but my bracket was crooked left to right. When you looked at how it sat on the bike, that that piece of steel that's the front of it, which is what the fairing mounts to, uh, was not straight. It was kiltered, uh, tilt, tilted off kilter to one side so that when you put the fairing on, it made the fairing turn like this. Um, that's not great. Uh, it's a big steel bracket that it's pretty difficult to get it to change direction or shape. Aside from, from that, uh, the fairing also, in order, it itself is not geometrically perfect. So again, it, it's hand laid fiberglass and there's gonna be some imperfections in it, but when you try to take a measurement of it, when you try to find a place to find a center, it starts to get really hard. And there's lots of places on the bike that take reference measurements as you're putting this on and making it straight. And the, the three that I was looking at the most were the gap between the fairing and the tank on both sides, the gap between the fairing and the fork on both sides, and then the gap between the fairing and the top triple tree on both sides. So operating under the assumption that the bike itself is straight, which let's hope it is, or all of this is just sort of a waste of time, um, you should be able to get all three of those reference points, a low one, a middle one, and then a rear one, get them so those gaps are equal in all three, relatively equal. I'm not saying perfect. Again, hand laid product, I get there's gonna be some variations, but anytime you would get one squared, the other two would be out of proportion. You'd get two of them and then a, a different third one would be, would be out of alignment. So what that tells you is, is that the fairing itself is crooked. It's, it's either twisted or, or tweaked or whatever it might be, it really isn't straight. And so when you're trying to get it to sit on the bike and have it be straight, it just doesn't want to be that way. So you're kind of up here, you have four mounting holes here. And so you're playing, the fairing has a lot of play um, in this sort of clockwise, counterclockwise rotational direction. And then it can come up and down uh, because the bracket is gonna move and pivot on the bike. So that gives you the ability to sort of massage it into place. And that is the type of alignment you'd expect to have to do to really play with that and tweak that. But if the fairing itself is sitting crooked on the bracket, no amount of twisting or up and down motion is gonna fix that. Um, so it really took a long time to get it. And I will tell you at this point, it is pretty damn close to perfect, um, but that's just because we made it work and we took our time and really just went at it to make sure that everything was perfect. Um, and obviously you're doing all this with the fairing unpainted, so uh, get, once you disassemble it and send it out for paint, you're gonna do it all again when you, when you go to put this back together because um, you're gonna have to get it recentered. So. I did mention the top bracket. There is another bracket um, that connects to the bottom here. Um, and you drill holes in the bottom of the fairing here and you bolt it here and then it bolts um, into the, the cross member between the two down tubes of the frame. Um, you know, as long as we're talking, I'll, I'll give a nitpick. The bolt that comes for this hole is too big. It's too thick to slide through. Again, it's meant to fit a certain bike, provide the right size bolt. Not the end of the world. Just go get yourself a new bolt, which is what we did, and we put it on. Um, but this bracket is also not really geometrically correct to the fairing and the bike. So it has a shape to it, and the fairing geometry is different. So that when you go to put that onto the fairing, it's going to want to pull on the fiberglass or pull on the bracket, which is steel, um, and make a mess. So what do you have to do? You have to bend that bracket. So basically it's about getting the fairing into the perfect spot and then bend that steel bracket in such a way that it will hold the fairing exactly there. Now, assuming that bracket was made straight, if you have to bend it to get the fairing to hold straight, obviously the answer is the fairing wasn't straight. So this is just a lot of 
Uh, I'm trying to give a little bit of detail here, a little bit of context, because I don't want to just say, like, this is a piece of shit and don't buy it. Um, I'm not saying that, and I'm not saying don't buy it. Um, what I'm saying is there may be a better value elsewhere, and uh, go into this with your eyes wide open um, if, if you're going to do one of these. Um, there are other, you know, U.S. manufacturers that make these, too. Um, you know, IMZZ has one. Um, there's a third one I'm blanking on, but there's others out there. So I guess sort of just do your research and, and, and get the one you want to get if you want to do this. But be prepared to have to make it work, um, which is, I guess, just part of the game. Um, but all that said, when the work is done, like I mentioned before, when I was sitting on the bike, you know, when you stand back and look at this, the bike looks awesome. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't knock anybody for wanting to do this setup on their bike. Um, just be aware of, you know, what the costs and implications are going to be, but don't think you're going to be unhappy with it because, you know, it does require, you know, replacing certain pieces, changing certain things. I mean, that's just the game, right? I mean, that's what we're doing, building bikes and customizing stuff. If you're going to be particular, you're going to wind up having to maybe buy things one or two or three times over, uh, to get exactly that thing that you're looking for. And you're going to have to modify those things that you do buy to get them to, to do what you want them to do. This right now is sort of a good stopping point for we'll call these first eight parts phase one, um, which was really getting just about everything we wanted to do on the bike done with the exception of everything having to do with the motor and drivetrain. And we will come back and pick up on that. Um, the thing we were waiting on, which was uh, DinoJet to come out with their 2021 uh, software update for PowerVision and the new cable. Uh, those, are, those exist and they're coming. Uh, they will be ready in a few weeks. So at that point, the floodgates will be open to start, you know, tearing into motors on 2021s, and we're going to do that. Um, we're probably not going to do it right away, so if you're sort of watching this video as it gets posted here at the middle end of September, um, it's going to be a little while before we get back to this bike, just because we've got some other stuff we want to do, so stay tuned for some other videos and things like that. Um, but realize that phase two for this bike will probably start, eh, it, it's hard to say, maybe in the next couple of months. Um, we'll figure out what we want to do um, and we'll start tearing into it. I do have some ideas about maybe doing the motor a couple of times over just to show you guys some different results on the dyno and things like that. Maybe just start with a cam and then uh, from there take the cam out and go to a big bore kit with a bigger cam and talk about the differences and see what the results are. I think it could be a cool little uh, sub-series of this series. Um, looking at what, what you can do with a 114 M8. So, uh, I guess that's enough. I think I've been talking for a long time. Um, I think uh, I do have some photos of what this sort of looked like as it was going together. I'll try and add those in here um, at the end, just so you can kind of see a little bit of progress on it. Um, again, I'm sorry we don't have an install video for you on this. It's just hopefully you can understand why, uh, <laughs> given all of the uh, tweaking and everything we had to do on this to get it to work. So. If you do want to see a simplified version of how it goes on, RWD does have a video. Um, full disclosure, it's not very helpful, um, but uh, you can go check it out and at least give you some idea of how this goes on. Um, all right, that's going to do it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.